the true spirit of ethics, I have many more questions than answers. Um, so I just, you know, one that sort of sprung to mind as we were listening to and watching the improvisational theater was about the potentially incompatible spheres of responsibility that we all have. Um, so we mostly focused on the sphere of responsibility in healthcare. What our responsibilities are as healthcare providers, our responsibilities to be compassionate and to um, stay and take care of our patients. And some people construe that as a societal obligation, right? Given the healthcare providers um, special training, there's no one else who can do some of these jobs. And we formed. So the argument goes, we formed a contract with society um, by virtue of our receipt of this advanced training and expertise, and we therefore owe society something. Quite what we owe, I think, is a little unclear. But, so we've talked a lot about how there's a professional obligation, and it's not totally clear exactly what that professional obligation is, but that there's a professional obligation to care. I guess my question is, um, well, what's not totally obvious to me is why um, personal obligations are lesser than professional obligations. So when you get married, um, you make a decision to get married or you make a decision to have children. It's not totally clear to me how that's different than making a decision to go to medical school or making a decision to go to nursing school, getting advanced training in a special way. You're, you're making obligations when you get that advanced training, when you make those decisions. You're making obligations to your future patients. And when you, when you get married, when you have kids, it also seems to me that you're, you're creating obligations to those people as well. So you have these potentially um, mutually exclusive kind of, in some ways, obligations to these two groups of people. And I guess the question I would pose to you is, which one, I mean, how, how could you possibly decide which one's more important? Something's going to win out, right? When push comes to shove, something's going to win out. And, and, and so my question is, is, I don't understand why we, um, we automatically assume that our professional obligations are more um, rigorous than our personal obligations. So I'm just interested to hear your thoughts on that. And I, to be clear, I have no idea what the right answer is. <laughs> I'm a second degree nursing student. I went to Catholic school for my first degree, and I feel like um, I have a very strong family life. So going into nursing is definitely a second degree for me, a second choice in life. and. I know in our ethics class, we talked a lot about, you know, your life choices and prioritizing and all that stuff. And in healthcare, we do prioritize, but we also learn in our ethics class about being happy. Like, you have to be happy with yourself before you can do things for other people. <clears throat> Sorry. And I mean, myself, my priority lies with family. That's just because I have strong, I have very strong ties with family. And then my job because I took this job to help my family, whereas other people might have, you know, like nursing or medical field is their first profession and, you know, they feel obligated to take care of patients and things like that first. But um, just like when your example was up there, I was just, you know, you had your compassion, your fear, and your responsibility, but like family kept falling back. And I was wondering, like, I feel like there's more components to being fearful of things that are happening and, and like, but where do you put your family? Like, that's how I am. I just think families, to me, I prioritize the family than my job and that's just how I am. You know, going to like my school and learning those kind of things. That's just how I think about it. I think family first, but I don't know, like, until I'm into that position, maybe I'd be like, I might come to the phone call to my family and say, go, I have responsibilities here. Like, I don't know how it's going to be until I'm in that situation, but I could say family first, but I think it's more, I was wondering. So, I guess th those who have a clear sense of which you would prioritize, why? Like, let, let's hear, let's hear why. If you feel, you know you would prioritize your professional responsibilities or you know you would prioritize family, how do you, how do you arrive at that? Or is this just completely idiosyncratic to individual people, values, preferences, no right or wrong? God first, family second, all else comes after that. That's the bottom line. And through God, all things are possible. 
you can do everything and with him by your side it doesn't matter I know the Ebola people die he's taught you to use your common sense he's taught you to be educated he's taught you to use your profession but when all else fails I too was involved with TMI I was a mother of a two-year-old and I had I was pregnant the bottom line was my dad wasn't afraid of anything my dad called me on the phone and said get out of town I got out of town <laughs> I went the 10 miles away thinking that would be safe and of course like the others here who experienced it we all knew that it didn't matter where we were and I think right now as a caregiver at the Masonic Village if I were on duty I would stay on duty because I now have three adult children one in st. Louis and I know that they would be able to take care of themselves and my three grandchildren and my son would do whatever he could to take care of, of them so I think you prioritize differently throughout your life <coughs> age has a factor in it where you're at what stage you're at but the bottom line is God family the rest falls in line I'm struggling with the concept of what I believe to be a healthy way of living my life, and that is to create balance, and that means family and professional career balance. And, and so in normal, everyday terms, I would say family needs to be more important because there are other places to be employed, there are other similar jobs to do, but family comes along one time. But I'm thinking about what Dr. Kingley mentioned, your question about what is humanism? Because it, it seems to me like some of the things we're talking about are those once-in-a-lifetime situations that pull us away from our normal way of thinking and believing and valuing to question what, what's most important in this different situation where humanity becomes one and we're looking at like a worldwide disaster or a national disaster and figuring out what is the role that we might play. So it would be different for me in these disasters and risks that we talked about versus the day-to-day -day way of, of surviving in what we think is a healthy way. off what Mary Lou said, um, what I haven't heard us um, speak of is what about wartime? If we all put our families in front of um, our desire to have a free country or fight for what we believe in, would we all just run away and, and allow um, disaster to occur? I, I liken Ebola to wartime. Um, TMI is a little different um, from the perspective of, from a healthcare agency, um, institution, there were people we needed to take care of, but there wasn't much that we could do to stop TMI from happening. Ebola, if we allow Ebola, if there aren't people to take care of Ebola patients, then the disease will overtake our society and it will kill us all. And don't we have a duty to protect our families by taking care of our patients? So for me, there's a differentiation um, between if there's something that we can do to help the greater good, then we have that obligation to take part in that um, above family. So there's, there's clearly a view in the ethics literature that simply by virtue of the fact of our humanity from, from sort of one person to another, we are obliged to try to help when we can do so at little personal risk, right? That's sort of a basic idea in ethics. And I think there's also sort of extending from that the view that healthcare providers have whatever the sort of baseline risk is that one or the baseline obligation that one human has to help another human 
if that's here, the healthcare provider obligation is like a little bit higher, right? Maybe it's not way up here, but it's a little bit higher. And so what's unclear, I think, is how much higher the healthcare provider obligation is and, and, and what, how, what, how to handle the increase or decrease in risk in helping. Because the thing that we all owe each other by virtue of our humanity is to help when we can do so at little personal risk to ourselves. And these scenarios aren't at little personal risk to ourselves, potentially. Potentially, they're, they could be great risk to ourselves. And so figuring out what that calculus is, I think, is where the rubber hits the road. I was just thinking that we probably are part of those professions, at least this is the way I view it, that uh, we go towards the smoke, we go towards the flames, we walk into the bullets, you know, along with firemen and policemen, we sign up. And I guess I would hope before someone signs up for clinical medicine and clinical nursing, that they think through that. Do they want to do that? And, and you know professionals, you know those of us who love running towards the trouble. So um, I think that's, that's part of personal decision and someone has said it several people have said it I think at different times in your life you choose you know I'm over 50 years old I've got nothing to lose you know so I, I can sort of talk big and brave um, and, but that makes a difference when when I was in my 30s and I had a child to take care of that was a totally different view so it's never static it's never the same I don't think um, and I think situations, for instance, 9-11, um, uh, we were out of the country, we were in Ireland, and uh, our daughter was an hour out of the city and her family, and we just wanted to get back home. And uh, on the plane back, we had heard then by that time what had happened in Shanksville, and on the plane back, I bet you there was not one person on that plane that had not decided we will take it down. It was incredible, the, the camaraderie and the, the strength of togetherness and the decisiveness. Thank you. I want to re reframe the question a little bit. So we learned from Dr. Ballard that about a third of the healthcare providers at the Med Center left. And then I think it was Sally who, was, who noted that there were no repercussions as far as she knew that people had left. So we've been talking about do healthcare providers have an obligation to stay? A different angle to look at it is, are the ones who left, did they do something that was unethical? Should they have gotten into trouble? Or, here, here's a hypothesis, is staying not mandatory but supererogatory, which is a fancy ethics word for meaning over and above the minimum. You know, I think that's a really interesting question, and I don't have the answer. But I think the answer, but I think the answer might be tied in an awareness of predetermination. So that if there had been disaster planning in place during the TMI incident, would people have known clearly what the consequences were to have chosen a particular course of action? And having that knowledge, would that then dictate your choice? And so today, you know, given some of us are much older now than we were then, that may impact our choices, as Mary Lou shared. But, you know, clearly, so would the decision of knowing the ramification, how we would be held accountable. Yeah, I, I'm getting the sense, like, we all want to say, we all want to say that we should stay, right? That there's a moral, that there's an obligation to stay. But, but then we're a little hesitant to, like, sl slap people on the wrist or have repercussions for those who leave. And if we're not willing to say, those of you who left did a bad thing, those of you who left did a wrong thing, then then I'm not totally clear on how we can say there's an obligation to stay. I think that goes back into your uh, 
your point of health ethics, there's no right or wrong. Well, that's not what I said. <laughs> well, like, <laughs> with this well, question. There's, there's, like, different, like, yeah. everyone prioritizes different, and who am I to say if you wanted, like, if I wanted to stay in health, but you had another, like, a family member at home that needed, you know, who would need help getting out and leaving, who am I to tell you you can't leave, like, that you're wrong? Mm -hmm. I think it goes back to that because it's just, I think it's such a, just an internal struggle to everybody. Because I mean, if I was here, I would stay. But then you're just like, I don't know. You know, I, I never want to. So I think after completely stirring the pot but not answering no, no, any no, questions. No, no, no. Oh, no. no I, just okay. <laughs> I was going to give it back to you to do whatever you needed to do to close. Mm -hmm. How much time do you need to close? Not much. Uh, Chris, you're up. <laughs> There's just one question. There's one question. There's a difference. There's a difference between a moral obligation to stay and a legal obligation to stay. And so, if your supervisor says, you know what, we have this emergency, you must stay, and you're mandated to stay and you leave, then you violated a legal obligation. But a moral obligation is is what the Three Mile Island was because there was so much unrest. And other than Dr. Jeffries, who is a take control type of person. If your supervisor did not come out with that mandate, I don't know that we can fault people that are making a choice to go home and do something else if they're not legally obligated. So I think it comes down to moral versus legal obligation. Getting my exercise today. <laughs> I, I wonder if there's a uh, difference be that surrounds the kind of threat Involved with, and it seems to me like, for example, with TMI and with Ebola and maybe with some other infectious problems across the country, that there have been issues of volunteerism and, and, and the option to volunteer as opposed to being mandated to stay. It seems like the greater the threat, the greater the risk, there often is that option to volunteer. So, and, and the interesting thing that, I, that I, I think is true is that those who volunteer don't look negatively upon those of us who don't, for whatever reason, can't for whatever reason do that, whether it's personal strength or whatever it may be. But those who volunteer do so in, in the best spirit. They, it feels right for them. And, uh, and I, I can't think of a time where they really look down on others for it's almost like they feel like they're the right ones to do it. You know, like they have what it takes and they're going to do it. And it's okay if you can't. I just wanted to read a couple of things. One was just not that long ago after um, SARS and that study that I, I told you about. Um, one of the public health officials was quoted interview is saying, I took this refusal or reluctance of health professionals to care for SARS patients, I think this refusal, refusal or reluctance of health professionals to care for SARS patients was perhaps one of the most troubling things that emerged from the epidemic. I was vexed, troubled, dismayed. I mean, we're, we're not talking about necessarily in or out. There's, there's a lot of gradations in between and there's a lot of the things that were going on in the, in the rainbow that, uh, of you know, that John kind of portrayed up here, and all the folks who helped him portray that, that I think are going on all the time, and, and um, you know, which makes this incredibly complex. During HIV, um, there was all the stigma early on associated with HIV, you know, I mean, this wasn't something that people wanted to be known as having because of the associations of HIV, and that added to the mix of people not wanting that uh, exposure and also at that time early on not knowing where it came from but there's also I think I think that one of the reasons it's important to have these conversations at, at all levels at the institutional level and at the societal level um, but within the profession as well there's a gentleman Patrick Wall, Wallace who wrote um, in an article that was published in 2011 he's at the London School of Economics but he concludes by saying the medical profession took the AIDS epidemic as a trial by combat of its contract with society, but it foundered on the realization that it could only issue guidelines, not orders, to its members. No real solution to the widespread reluctance of healthcare workers to treat patients who 
and they believe put their own lives at risk was achieved within the professional framework. In this, as, as in much else, AIDS underlined the fragility of everyday healthcare systems in times of crisis. I mean, and that's what we're still left with. I mean, there, there were legal um, results from HIV and, and uh, clearly civil rights issues and a variety of things, and, and the risk became very low and, and, and is even lower now, but of uh, risk of transmission. But, but we're still going to be faced with, you know, Ebola was kind of a, a, a non-threat in this country, more or less. Other things are going to be higher threat, and it may well be an influenza uh, pandemic. It might be bioterrorism. I mean, we have no idea, but but it may involve large groups of people, and everybody, whether you're a dermatologist or an emergency physician or uh, an emergency room uh, nurse or a frontline nurse, you know, that, and there's also a lot of literature, and, and that's why I thought it was so important to have a variety of disciplines here on gender uh, perspectives on care, um, especially during the 1918 uh, influenza pandemic. A lot of edicts came from, from mostly men in, in political positions saying, if you're a woman, go out and take care of people because you know how to do that. Whether you had any training or not, you need to go do that. And in, the, in, a, in a number of areas in the literature, it talks about how you know, these folks showed up for a day and then never showed up again because they had no training and they were, they were scared to death. And they, their, their fatality rate was very high for that kind of exposure. So, we as a society and as a profession, our institutions, our profession, our society, we have a lot to try to take on. And, uh, and a lot of it has to do with communicating. And I think Ebola, with all the, the terror that was provoked in society over non-exposures, just, just showed us that we're just not, we're, we're not really ready and we're not immune to that. So I don't, I don't know. It's just, it's really striking. The more you read, the more you feel like, what have we learned and where are we going with that? Yeah. Uh, I'm Kano Makro Porza uh, from Ethiopia. Uh, I'm, I was trying to track where it goes and how it goes. Uh, I, I just wanted to cite uh, an example as risky taking uh, Dr. Thomas Lambe from, he was from Pittsburgh, I think, and uh, he was stationed in, the, in Sudan. He was working with the Sudan Interior Mission then, and one of the governors in Ethiopia was, there was an epidemic, and because of the epidemic, the government didn't know what to do. And he knew that there were a group of doctors uh, stationed in the Sudan. So he sent a message to that station. And Dr. Thomas Lambe volunteered to come from over to Ethiopia to treat the people uh, who were suffering from that epidemic. So uh, the risk he took was he had to use boats on the Blue Nile. And then he had to travel on mule, the back of the mules. And then he came over to Gore, which is, uh, he came over to Gambena, and then to Gore. And then he, he was stationed around the Bidolo area. And then he built a hospital. And then from there he went over to uh, Addis Ababa, which is the capital city. And then he, he first worked in a very small room. And he, were, he, he used prayer and treating. Prayer as a pastoral service. And then he, he did the treatment with medicine and all that. So the risk he took was that he used that small area. And from there, uh, he established a school from that small room. It grew onto uh, a school, uh, a hospital, which is now a pastor institute, pastor institute, it's a research, research, research place now. And part of it became a church. And part of that, where I was working, became the uh, American Mission Girls' School. 
But then finally, Dr. Lamy has had to lose his nationality. He was an American national, but he, wrote, he lost his nationality for a certain reason, which uh, he must have done something wrong, and then he came over. And I, I, I was able to read his book, uh, A Doctor Without a Country. And that, that's the risk that he took. He came over and then he regained his nationality, that's what I know. And finally, he was buried uh, in Pittsburgh. And so he lost his, national, his uh, religious affiliation. He was with the Presbyterian Church and then with the Interior, Sudan Interior Mission. And finally, he even came to lose his nationality and later gained it. So the risk for the physicians or health uh, professionals is not really limited to a spot or a very a small area or a very small contribution. So it's big and uh, we can't really say it accounts to this much. It's a lot and it could be physical, it could be emotional, it could be psychological. So that's, I just wanted to cite this risk which has come to mind. Thank you. So we're just about at the uh, at the end. Any any last thoughts or comments? Uh, I, I guess it was nice to hear an inspirational story. There's so uh, so many things to think about. Um, but it seems to me that the foundational ethics question. Um, that we don't really have time to talk about is how much personal risk should healthcare providers be obliged to take on in the pursuit of patient care? And so I think it's on a spectrum, and I think we'd all agree that we'd agree on either end, and the challenge is, is sort of where in the middle of the spectrum is an acceptable level of personal risk that we are obliged to take on versus an unacceptable that that we're not obliged to take on. Yeah, I guess I would just add in, in your answers, um, the people who did uh, complete the survey, it ran that, that whole gallop, that whole gamut, with, with most people being, you know, in the middle under cir some circumstance or another. There were some people who felt um, like the uh, apothecary in, in London in 1660 this is, you know, the captains sign up to, to fight a war, and the, and the uh, leaders sign up to lead, and doctors sign up to heal the sick, and that's that's it. You know, I mean, so the, there were some among the people answered who basically felt there you, you, you shouldn't be able to opt out. There were there were some who felt it, it's really up to the person, and then a lot of people are in between on that. And I think, um, I guess, there's a lot of studies that show the same thing. So I. Um, we, we don't have answers to that, I, but I'd, I'd really be interested if anybody has any final thoughts. I, you know, first of all, you know, great session. Thanks for uh, the invite. Um, the other thing, obviously, you can tell I work for Lifeline, but uh, no, I'm, I'm good. Can everybody hear me? I have a big mouth. But uh, <laughs> um, do a lot of special operations on the outside for FEMA, go into a lot of disasters, hit the all the major disasters in the last 25 years. I always want to come home, okay, at the end of the day. I think you folks do too. Um, the reason of all the stuff that went on in the hospital, I helped do a little planning and preparation with that. And I think at the end of the day, that's what you really need to, to do. You're highly educated folks. We can mitigate a lot of the stuff that could happen around us with planning, preparation, education. So it's a key center here to, to take care of a lot of that stuff. But at the end of the day, we have to do the risk versus the reward analysis when we go in. Every, every day we take the helicopter off, we're doing a risk assessment of what's the threat. Obviously, weather is a threat for us and a bunch of other things. So we'll do a risk assessment. Nobody's asking anybody in this room, including myself, to commit suicide if the risk is that great. Because at the end of the day, we need you to return tomorrow to take care of other patients. So. I guess the moral that we use even in the, the federal disaster stuff, we'll risk a lot to gain a lot, okay? So we'll, we might risk a squad of people if we're going to save a school that's going to implode. Um, 
So just pretty much how we see it. And I think, you know, the healthcare professionals have to look at it, that emergency services risk analysis too because my colleagues, police, firemen, and everybody else are doing those same risk assessments every day. And we just sort of need to tune that in. But we need you here tomorrow too. Like, I thank, like to thank all of you because this was this was very much a participatory event, and um, I want to thank Becky Hi, exactly. and Joe and Ballard, and particularly Catherine Burke, who came the farthest to help us out here today. And and this was clearly an unusual kind of way to interact. So uh, thank Thanks you. For all. Going. Yeah. <laughs>